Welcome to Mount Sinai Future U, a show highlighting innovation and research at Mount Sinai that are changing patients' lives. Neurons in the brain release electrical signals that tell your body what to do. When those signals misfire, seizures happen. For one teen with autism, the seizures were especially debilitating, which is why he opted to have a special device implanted on his brain. It works by detecting unusual activity and sending electrical pulses to normalize brain waves. We begin our broadcast with Matthias' story. Most people don't think of brain surgery as a fabulous, wonderful news, but in our case, it, it definitely was fabulous and wonderful news. And you know, at least we have something to look forward to now that something will change. Matthias is 18 years old. He has autism and developed what is considered medically refractory epilepsy two and a half years ago. He had no history of epilepsy or seizure disorder at all, and uh, one day we woke up and he was on the floor having a very long, massive, life-threatening seizure. He just continued to get worse, and he's lost his activities of daily living, his independence. He can no longer dress himself, brush his teeth, uh, sometimes even eating. His gait is altered. He can't speak. He has a very profound stutter, cognition. Every aspect of his life to the point where, you know, his quality of his life is very poor. Intractable epilepsy is epilepsy that continues to occur in a patient despite taking therapeutic medications. My personal history with epilepsy surgery has involved caring for many patients who have autism. Kids who have autism and epilepsy together, which happens about 30% of the time, have a much more difficult time managing both conditions. Autistic behaviors are dramatically made worse in the setting of intractable epilepsy, and this becomes a nightmare on top of a very difficult situation for the families. For years we've been doing epilepsy surgery in patients with autism, but now Neuropace has given us an option that has been more successful and less invasive. Neuropace is basically a pacemaker for the brain. It's an implant that we use to modulate the brain's activity rather than destroy it. We place electrodes at the site of what we think is the epileptic network, and that is connected to a pacemaker that gets implanted in the skull. That device is capable of recording the brain waves, and then in response to when it detects a seizure, stimulate the brain to stop the seizure in its tracks. The responsive neurostimulator detects the beginning of a seizure or a, or a pattern that maybe could become a seizure and then it delivers stimulation to stop the seizure from developing. One of the things that I see a lot is people are so fearful of having surgery and what I don't think people are thinking about is the risk that they're taking every day by having intractable epilepsy. We were really thrilled when they said to come to speak with Dr. Katan because they had agreed to do the surgery when you have run out of hope. It's a very powerful thing, just the hope part in terms of, of someone improving. I'm very optimistic that other patients who have autism and epilepsy are going to benefit from this procedure. We've had numerous patients who've had a dramatic change in their behaviors whereas before they were unpredictable and could be very aggressive, are much more engaged, much more capable of learning. These are major milestones in quality of life. We've had nothing but enthusiasm from those parents who have made the decision to go forward with this. We'll be sure to update you on Matthias' progress in our upcoming broadcasts. Researchers here at Mount Sinai are closely studying epilepsy and ways to help patients. Dr. Ann Schaefer was recently awarded Inventor of the Year by Mount Sinai Innovation Partners for her work discovering a potential cure for intractable seizures. The Inventor of the Year award is Ann Schaefer. The Inventor of the Year, it's a huge honor. I was really excited, surprised. It's something that 
you know, it's not me. It really is to the credit of all the people in my lab working very hard on this project. Epilepsy is a disorder where you have a disbalance in the activation or the inhibition of neurons. You either have too much activity or too little inhibition, and both cases can lead to epilepsy. We study the mechanism that may contribute to the balance, the function of the cell. We are interested in mechanism that will make a too excited neuron a little bit less excitable, or a too inactive neuron a little bit more active. And we do that by looking at a group of genes that are collectively regulated together to recreate or to shift the balance back into a normal state. We found a while ago a small RNA that can regulate the activity of neurons depending on how many times this molecule is expressed in the neuron. And we found if you have too little of it, you're predisposed and you develop very severe seizures. If we increase its expression slightly, that we can protect very efficiently from epilepsy and seizure disorders and can rescue the disease of human epilepsy disorders in mouse models. We, I would say, to 95% suppress the occurrence of seizures. It's really, in a way, a lab award rather than a personal award for having a team that was able to move a discovery into potential therapy, that we will be able to modulate neuronal responses in such an effective way that we may actually be able to help people to live a more normal life. Mount Sinai Innovation Partners was helping me throughout the whole process, from creating the pattern for our discovery to several years of reaching out to commercial partners that we are now at a level where we can take it into the development of a potential therapy. I'm extremely thrilled that I was chosen. I did not see that coming. It motivated my lab and myself to do even better, so it's a fantastic recognition. The Seaver Autism Center integrates research and clinical outcomes to provide children and adults with autism the best possible care. In this week's In Their Own Words segment, Dr. Joseph Buxbaum shares how personalized medicine is leading to innovative treatments for autism. I think I've always known I was going to be a scientist, even from a young age. And I think ultimately for most scientists, we want to work on things that we can make a difference on. Autism is an area where I personally can make a difference. My name is Joseph Buxbaum. I'm the director of the Siever Autism Center for Research and Treatment here at Mount Sinai. I'm a professor in the Department of Psychiatry as well. Mount Sinai is really built on the principle of integrating basic science, patient-based research, and clinical care as one entity. And that's what the Seaver Autism Center does, and that's why we fit so well with the Sinai mission. In my lab, we use genetics to find genes that are mutated when you have autism. And understanding a cause of a disorder is a means by which we can find new treatments. It is my belief that without personalized medicine, we will not do a good job of treating autism. Because autism is not a single entity. Treatment for one person may never work for the next person and vice versa. We now realize just how complicated it is. Different kinds of mutations, different genes, different kinds of inheritance. But we're at a point now that we actually can put it all together. And so that's changed everything. We are really at a critical point now where in the next years, we're gonna see major changes based on our ability to do genetics, our ability to study the brain in the laboratory as well as in patients. My commitment is that within five years, we will be at a path where we will have new treatments for autism. And at the end, it comes back to families and the feeling that we are partners working together towards this common goal. Working together on something that's so important for the families and for the individuals, feel like we're a part of their lives, that we are actually making a difference for them. That's what gets me to work every day. The causes of autism remain unknown, but one physician is searching for clues in our genes. His research could pave the way for more targeted treatments. What drives me in my work is working with families and children and the hope of trying to make their lives better. You can make small changes, say even small things, but you can hear or see it resonate with a child and it, it has a big impact and it can change their lives. In my practice, I'll see kids with autism, anxiety, ADHD, depression. We are focused on developing new treatments. That's the main goal of our program. What we've started to do is think about autism not as a very 
broad disorder as much as trying to figure out what are the single gene causes that are associated with autism. The field of autism has evolved dramatically in the last five or ten years, mostly because of the advances in genetic technology. The ability to identify specific genes that are going wrong has really driven the field forward in more specific and targeted treatments. And I think for families, having an idea of what causes autism in a given child is really powerful because they know the reason. They blame themselves, they blame the environment, but here when you can identify a specific gene that's gone wrong, that's the reason. It also gives you some sense of what might potential treatments be in the future. The hope is that we'll just be doing a much better job in terms of the impact of the treatments. The combination of being able to help individual kids and families, but also the, the idea that the work that you're doing can affect whole populations of kids is a big motivator for me. In this week's Alumni Pride segment in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, Dr. Bonnie Davis talks about her med school experience and how it led to studying the brain and ultimately Alzheimer's disease. I was on my way to a different school and a page came through for me to answer the phone. It was Jay Cohen from the Mount Sinai Admissions Office saying that a place had opened up from the wait list and did I want to attend? And I was very excited. This school was a dream 50 years ago. We were small, we were 40 people, only five women. We were all new, the faculty and the students were new. We knew we were in a hospital where there were the people who wrote the books, got Nobel Prizes. You could hardly sit in your seat. I was always interested from probably about 10 years old in wanting to know how the brain worked and how that made us work. What I wanted to do was to solve problems, to figure out riddles, to make us able to do the things that we couldn't do. And through some of the things I learned at Sinai and the credential and the career that enabled me to have, I was able really to pursue that all my life, and still do. When it came time to think about treating Alzheimer's disease, the really popular option was to get a chemical which would just sit on the receptor for acetylcholine, which is a chemical that goes between nerve cells that goes down in Alzheimer's disease. And I thought, you know what? That receptor doesn't work that way. It does get acetylcholine, but it gets it in a Morse code. And there, there might be information in that code. And so I thought that there were other ways of treating which would preserve that message. Um, and ultimately, those are the ones which became useful for Alzheimer's. I'm proud that I can claim an association with an institution that commands so much respect in terms of the research we do, the patients we take care of. I think for me and probably for the other trustees, you want to take an institution like this and help it be the best it can. I would not be the person I am today without Sinai. Happy anniversary to the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. The open source miniature microscope system uses tiny cameras from cell phones and plastics to allow doctors to see into the brain. And by reading brain activity, physicians can identify neurons responsible for diseases like post-traumatic stress disorder and silence those neurons. We developed an open source miniature microscope system. So essentially what we do is we take the little cameras from your cell phone, they're really tiny, and we take some plastics and we make a little miniature microscope. What this technology does is allow us to peer into the brain. We can watch the neural activity. So the idea is that we can you know, use the same kind of measurement and understanding general principles of brain activity across species. If we can read the activity of your brain, then we will know, you know which are the neurons that represent your mom or maybe a traumatic experience, for example. And then later on, we can then selectively go into those specific neurons that we read out from and write into those neurons. So let's say we will now silence the neurons of that traumatic experience, right? And maybe that this can benefit PTSD. My lab also studies aging and age-related cognitive decline. And something I always, you know, tell people when I talk about my research is that aging is inevitable. We are all going to age, hopefully. Um, but maybe cognitive decline does not have to be. 
And if we can really understand what happens, what are the precursors to Alzheimer's, what are the precursors to dementia, mild cognitive impairment, we can stop it before it begins. And I think what really inspired me to think about this was my mom. And uh, my mom is aging, and um, you know she's always been a vibrant, very healthy person. And I just saw how rapidly her mind was declining in the last few years. And it really started me thinking about, well, what can we do to solve this problem? Um, and so my lab is actively working on it. If we could actually help people to remember better, right? Remember who their daughter is and not get confused. Um, for example, that would be extremely meaningful because we would um, be tapping into how to make humanity better. Brain imaging is a tool providing a spectacular and colorful perspective of the brain and how it works. Imaging is helping researchers improve their understanding of complex neurological disorders and how they treat those diseases. In this next segment, a series of interviews with several physicians who discuss how brain imaging is changing medicine. I am studying ways to improve imaging of the brain, in particular magnetic resonance imaging. So I'm applying uh, new signal transmission methods to um, image the brain in greater detail and to impart different kinds of information in the brain. Um, then we translate these techniques to different neurological diseases and disorders. We're applying advanced imaging techniques, we're applying um, uh, new MRI scanners that operate at a higher field strength, such as 7 Tesla, in order to elucidate tinier, more subtle abnormalities that uh, then could be really valuable in guiding surgery. When you're able to see clearer pictures, essentially, you're able to see the abnormalities uh, and detect them. They're more conspicuous. I think that uh, imaging is actually a very good application of engineering principles and physics and mathematics. Um, and people don't realize that it's such an elegant application of that and it's, uh, it's kind of marrying uh, the gratification that one gets from helping people and actually immediately applying a tool to help their lives um, to some of the neat uh, engineering algorithms and, and uh, techniques that we learn. So our lab is um, very interested in uh, emotional learning and memory, um, in trauma and resilience, and uh, how trauma affects people's brains. Functional neuroimaging allows us to track um, proxies of neural activation um, over time when we perform all sorts, all sorts of uh, cognitive and psychological tasks. What we track is blood flow to uh, various regions of the brain, which uh, tells us how much a brain is active. And what we ask is, um, is this type of information encoded by the brain? And what we found is that um, a region in the brain called the hippocampus is tracking this information, these uh, social coordinates. And um, this was fascinating for us because the hippocampus is also involved in spatial navigation. This is very important for mental health because uh, in almost every mental uh, disorder, there is social dysfunction. Um, and also in many mental disorders, there is also this function of the hippocampus. But no one really made that link. So it is possible that uh, across disorders, what we have is a problem in tracking and representing our social environment because of uh, hippocampal dysfunction. And this is what we want to uh, identify now, how um, the brain is encoding social uh, environment uh, in different disorders whether the hippocampus uh, underlies that and whether it relates to your uh, resilience. There's obviously a lot to do in terms of mood and anxiety disorders. Our mission is to discover new treatments uh, for patients and we really try and capitalize on the breakthroughs at the basic, the molecular neuroscience level being done at Mount Sinai and other places. We have several projects but one of the ones I'm most excited about that we recently started is a clinical trial of a novel type of antidepressant medication where we're using brain imaging to look at how does the medication actually affect the neural circuits and systems in the brain that we think are controlling depression. And really a lot of people don't know this, but although depression is among the most disabling illnesses and we have many treatments, there's still a lot we don't know about how these treatments work, what the basic causes of depression are, and without things like brain imaging, we have trouble understanding or sort of what we call translating from basic studies in mouse models to actual new treatments for patients.
So we try and use brain imaging to kind of fill that gap. If this medication can be shown to be effective and maybe more importantly, what brain regions it's working on, how it's working, then that could o open up new ways to treat patients, new uh, pathways of how to discover drugs that work completely differently from the types of, for example, antidepressant medications we have available uh, for patients today. This one too. My lab focuses on obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD. Um, OCD is uh, about 3% of the population, and it tends to have a chronic course, and it's one of the top 10 leading causes of disability worldwide. So what my lab does is uses fMRI to try to study the underlying neurobiology of the disorder in order to improve treatments for it. So right now, we actually do have a trial that we're running, testing the use of a treatment to affect brain circuits associated with sensory symptoms in OCD. So we found that this area of the brain called the insula, specifically the mid and posterior regions, is associated, is more active in, in OCD patients with severe sensory symptoms. So what we're doing is we're testing the use of a pharmacological treatment that we've shown reduces activity in this part of the brain to see if it will actually affect these symptoms in these patients. We're also testing to see whether it affects the other cluster of symptoms um, so we can try to sort of distinguish them better and uh, find more personalized approaches to treatment. And the chief of the Brain Imaging Center, which is part of the TIMI, the Translational and Molecular Imaging Institute. So my lab is using a multimodal imaging approach to study the neural correlates that underlie drug addiction. So now we can understand, we can choose and pick the right imaging modality to answer the questions we have about what changes in the brain with addiction and what changes are there before addiction develops, maybe enhancing the propensity to become addicted. So with imaging tools, we're able to pinpoint the pathways and the brain regions that underlie those impairments in self-control in the context of drugs and drug-related cues. When we know the impairments, we can actually do something about it. And we, when we know also individual differences, so not everybody is the same. And we can then look at groups of individuals using our imaging modalities and using the brain reactivity to certain cues and how the brain responds in a certain context to certain tasks. We can use that data to identify certain groups within addicted individuals that may respond to targeted treatments and interventions. TIMI, for short, is a, a cluster of faculty members who are interested in multiple disease processes and they are using imaging as a tool to try to understand that disease. Right now we're working with projects. One of them is in the area of depression, trying to, to understand the effect of depression uh, on the brain but also on the immune system. Today, you know, if you are undergoing, let's say, chemotherapy or undergoing some new therapy such as immunotherapy to treat cancer, you need to follow up after initiation of the therapy, what's happening to the tumor? Is it changing in size? But is it also changing in structure? And is the new therapy helping it or not? Imaging, especially with PET, but also with MRI, can, can give you that better, that information quantitatively and non-invasively. We're also diagnosing disease early on. Before it manifests itself, we are able to see the disease and detect it early on. We can detect smaller structures. We have also unique techniques that we developed our, ourselves. So people come and knock on our door uh, to try to access these new techniques. So that's an added value we feel that we bring not only to Mount Sinai, but we also bring to the, to the, to the, to the New York community here. In our final story of the broadcast, emergency room visits have increased by 20% over an eight-year period. At the same time, our population is aging. It's why Mount Sinai is focused on improving population health, which includes offering a new home-based model of care. What we did was essentially a study of all U.S. emergency departments nationwide from 2006 to 2014, and we looked at ED visits among adults and some of the patient demographics of so people who were seeking care, and then we looked at how likely patients were to be hospitalized after coming to the ED after a visit. And really what we found was three main things. First of all, ED visits continue to increase, outpacing the rate of population growth, so they've actually increased by 20 
20% over that eight year period alone. Second, ED demographics of patients are changing rapidly. Patients have gotten much older on average. Patients have more comorbid chronic illness on average and are also more likely to have public insurance, so specifically Medicare or Medicaid as opposed to some sort of private insurance and also are actually more likely to be from zip codes with lower incomes. I think it has really big implications for both utilization, quality, and costs. And I think one of the biggest, somewhat surprising findings that was that despite these changing demographics, patients are actually less likely to be admitted, and it's the older, sicker patients who are less likely to be admitted. So I think that speaks to the amount of work that's being done in emergency departments nationwide, and the fact that emergency departments are a portal for this transition from an outpatient setting of care to the inpatient setting of care. I think Mount Sinai is an example of an institution that's really embraced this population health goal, and so I think our findings dovetail nicely with the new ACO um, and some of the work we're trying to do uh, in improving social determinants and encouraging people to be cared for uh, in a home-based setting. Thank you for watching Mount Sinai Future U. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for updates on our next episode.